Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> we will be, go ahead and begin our worship service now. And we will start with a prelude. You'll be muted as our music director, David Chapman, plays Don't Get Around Much Anymore by Duke Ellington. Thank you, David. Welcome to virtual worship at Paint Branch Unitarian Universalist Church. I am Susanna Schiller, and I'm one of seven worship associates, lay members who collaborate with our minister, Rachel Christensen, and other service leaders on Sunday services. I'm happy you chose to be here in pursuit of spiritual renewal. Before we move into worship, make sure you know how to use Zoom. And let me also apologize for any confusion there might have been with the Zoom link this morning or with us having to do a waiting room and let you in through that. Zoom made some changes over the past week, and we're doing our best to work with that. Make sure you know where the mute button or microphone icon is and make sure you are muted throughout the service so we can all hear the speakers and David's piano clearly. And bring up your chat screen. The bubble for your chat screen is in different places depending on what kind of device you're using. In chat, please say how many people are viewing from your screen. Type one if it's just you. Later in the service, you will be invited to use the chat feature to post your joys and sorrows. If you are new to worshiping here, please post your name and contact information in chat so we can contact you later since we cannot greet you in physical space as we normally would do. You will have the option of joining a small chat group when the service is over or staying in the main meeting to talk with our guest minister. Now, let me introduce our guest minister. Pastor Katie Colbert is a graduate from, the from Meadville Lombard Theological School, where she received two graduation awards, Leadership in Religious Education and Excellence in Preaching. She graduated from University of South Florida with a degree in Religious Studies. She served as intern minister for two years in Sarasota, Florida, where she was ordained in 2016. She has worked as the director of religious education at the UU Church of Tampa and as a chaplain at Tampa General Hospital. Katie lives in Tampa with her two teenage sons and a pit bull. She and Rachel Christensen have known each other for 25 years. Katie. I unmute myself. Good morning, everyone from sunny, hot, 
humid and beautiful Tampa, Florida. I am so grateful to be spending this morning with you as we worship together through the magic of technology. I have such gratitude to my good friend, Rachel, as Susanna mentioned, Reverend Rachel Christensen, and I have been friends for a very long time, and I just want to uh, let her know how grateful I am for her to extend the invitation to me to be with you today. So let us open our worship service with these words written by Robert French Liebens. Holy and beautiful is the custom which brings us together in the presence of the Most High to face our ideals, to remember our loved ones in absence, to give thanks, to make confession, to offer forgiveness, to be enlightened and to be strengthened. Through the quiet hour, we breathe the worship of the ages, the cathedral music of history, three unseen guests attend, faith, hope, and love. Let all our hearts prepare them place. Now our first video recording this morning is a beautiful song. It's called Wo Ya Ya. It is sung in many of our UU congregations across the world. Um, if you haven't sung it before, if you haven't heard it before, enjoy the, the beauty of this today. It is the, in the video, it's sung by an artist um, from Ghana and her name is I want to say we yala, trying my hardest with my, my Louisiana Southern pronunciation there. It's a beautiful song, and so open yourselves up to its beauty. We are going, heaven knows where we are going. But we know we will get there We are going Heaven knows where we are going But we know we will get there Yeah. 
now we know we will. And now I'm going to light my virtual chalice. Let us say the chalice lighting words together. We light the chalice to celebrate Unitarian Universalism. This is the church of the open mind, the helping hands, the loving heart, and the radiant spirit. And sendamos esta caliz para celebrar el unitarismo universalismo. Esta es la iglesia de la mente abierta, de las manos amigas, del amor del corazón y del espíritu radiante. So now is our time for all ages. I don't know how many children are joining us this morning. I haven't really been able to look through all the pictures, but this is what I call a time for all ages. So no matter if you're young and young at heart, this is for everyone. Okay, so start off with, I know it is very hard for y'all to believe, but I was born and raised in the South. The accent might have thrown you off a little bit. You know, maybe you're thinking I was from New Jersey, California. No, nope, born and raised in Louisiana. And in the South, it is very common for women to wear pearls. So I have two strands of pearls I want to show y'all. So these are my pearls. Both strands are broken because I have a tendency of breaking things, unfortunately. But I'm going to get them fixed soon. Anyway, these are my pearls. And the thing that uh, about pearls and uh, Southern women is we don't wear them just with our fancy clothes, but we also wear them with our jeans and our cowboy boots. So I normally have my pearls on all the time. We love our pearls. I wonder if you know how a pearl is made, how it's formed. So here's a little pearl right here, okay? So pearls come from kinds of shellfish, such as oysters that live in the water. And there's an interesting story about how a pearl is made. I wonder if you've ever gotten sand in your eye. I go to the beach, being in Florida now, I go to the beach all the time. I cannot wait to go to the beach this week. Um, but sometimes you will get sand in your eye and it is very uncomfortable. Maybe you've noticed that when you get something in your eye, tears form to try to wash whatever is in your eye out of it and get rid of it. Well, that is very similar to what shellfish do. So when certain kinds of shellfish get a grain of sand inside of their shells, it is uncomfortable for them, okay? And so they've been designed to excrete a pearly white substance to cover the grain of sand so it won't be so rough and irritating. And so layer upon layer of this substance forms, what do I do with that little pearl? Like this, okay? Layer upon layer of the substance forms around that little piece of sand until a beautiful pearl is made. And so I was thinking, this is kind of like it is with you and me. We have been created to make something beautiful with our lives. And history has shown that humans, we create some of the most beautiful things after some kind of trouble or great challenge. No one, no one has a perfect life that is free from trouble. And so when trouble or disappointment strikes, remember, the shellfish, okay? Remember the shellfish, which, which takes that trouble, takes that sand, and turns it into something beautiful, like pearls. And so today, I would like to encourage all the children and the adults as well 
to make a list of as many people as you can think of who responded to life's challenges by making something beautiful in the world. Now, Susanna will share with us a reflection about a challenge she has faced in her life and how she found comfort in those moments. Susanna? Thank you, Katie. I have lots of experience with hospitals, fortunately as the next of kin, not the patient. My husband injured his back in a fall in 1994 and he had a spinal fusion for it in 1996. The spinal fusion worked well, but the side effects of the way they did it were significant. He's had over a dozen surgeries since that time and even more hospitalizations that don't require surgery, but do require a trip to the emergency room followed by a week or more inpatient. When all this started, we had preschool children and we both worked full time. That made juggling childcare, school schedules, and work especially difficult. I was blessed with wonderful neighbors and understanding bosses. It's gotten easier as my daughters grew up and teleworking from hospital rooms became possible. But trips to the hospital, even when we have a good idea of what's going on and what the treatment will be, are never fun. Let me also say, I'm not a patient person or a good caregiver. I always have things I want or need to be doing, and they don't involve nursing an invalid, waiting on someone, or otherwise being solicitous. I don't appreciate being interrupted or asked to change my plans. I get very resentful about being removed from my daily routine, and that makes me unpleasant to be around. I'm saying that lightly. I don't like to sit around and wait, but that's a primary hospital activity. But I've had plenty of years to develop an approach, really a spiritual practice to help me cope. As many of you know, I am an avid knitter. I always have a portable knitting project underway. So when we decide a trip to the emergency room is needed, I grab my purse and my knitting and get in the car. Time in an ER moves differently than it does elsewhere. Mostly it drags, but it is punctuated by interruptions and occasional flurries of activity. I found that having something repetitive and soothing to do with my hands helps me to stay calm amid the stress caused by the severe pain that my husband is experiencing and the uncertainty about when he will feel better. The other thing I do for myself once he's been admitted to the hospital is to make sure I get regular exercise, even if it's just taking a few minutes to walk briskly, getting my heart rate up in a constructive way makes a big difference to my ability to be patient for the rest of the day. Although I recognize that I'm a lousy caregiver, let me extrapolate from my own experience to say, no matter how generous a caregiver someone is, they can't give all the time. At some point, they need to recharge their own batteries. Obviously, regular nutritious meals and rest are important, but I don't believe they're enough when someone is under stress and outside their regular routine. Whenever giving advice to other caregivers, I ask, what's that one thing you need to keep grounded? For me, it's exercise. For someone else, it might be a phone call with a friend. It might be a chocolate shake. It might be meditation, or it might be a power nap. But you need to figure out what that thing is and make sure you get it regularly so that you are ready to be a good caregiver the rest of the time. It isn't a treat, and it isn't something to feel guilty about needing. You're not being selfish. 
It's the airbag on the airplane that you're told to put on before helping others. And now let us join our hearts and minds in a time of prayer and meditation. As we gather in community, we carry with us life's hurts and its great joys. Sometimes sharing those joys and concerns in community can help. While we listen to David play What's Going On by Marvin Gaye, I encourage you to submit your joys and sorrows by entering them into the chat bar. Let us take a moment to acknowledge all that has been shared, as well as those joys and sorrows that remain unspoken and yet are on our minds and in our hearts. So, as uh, y'all know, as we've mentioned, I worked as a chaplain at Tampa General Hospital uh, throughout this campaign, uh, through this, uh, throughout this uh, pandemic. Um, so here is something I want to share with y'all. This is uh, something I heard right at the beginning, and it's this. Who's got the N95s? Who's got the N95s? I remember hearing this as I stood about five feet away from a woman on a gurney surrounded by health professionals in the trauma bay who were doing chest compressions on her and trying to save her life. Now, N95s 
You might not have ever heard of an N95 before March. I don't think I did. I don't, I don't think I knew what the heck an N95 was or PPE, which is personal protective equipment. N95s are the masks that we wear as healthcare folks that keep us safe from being exposed to COVID-19. So we're in the trauma bay and no one was wearing one. Like I said, this was at the very, very beginning. So in about two minutes, N95 masks were being flung from a box that someone had grabbed at the nurse's station and everyone around was, uh, the patient was putting on these N95 masks. And as this was going on, I was kind of slowly moving away from the commotion and putting as much distance between myself and the possible COVID patient as I could, which is not what I normally do. Um, normally, as a chaplain, what I do is I get right into the face of the patient that is brought into the trauma bay, and I try to find out who their people are, who are they, who, who can I call, that type of thing. So thankfully, when I talk to the paramedic in the hallway, which is what we do to try to get information, because they're the ones that normally get all the information when they pick the person up in the ambulance, um, they were able to tell me that the family was on the way and that that was taken care of. So there was no need for me to approach the patient who was possibly COVID positive, ended up they were not COVID positive, thankfully. Um, but I was very relieved that I didn't have to put my face next to her face, not knowing. And so this was my first experience with what we call a rule out. So a rule out is someone who has not yet been tested, ruled out, but who is presenting with COVID symptoms, which we're all very familiar now with the COVID symptoms, with the coughing and the fever and all of these things. Um, we were not prepared, prepared at all. We are very prepared now. Let me just tell you that. TGH is so prepared and we were on it, but at the beginning, this was something that was really new and none of us, none of us were prepared for what was to come. We were not prepared to see our hospital. Our hospital, we're a level one trauma center in Tampa. And I wanna say we're about at 1200 beds. We're a big, big hospital. So we were not prepared to see that um, half our hospital was gonna empty because if it wasn't a life-saving procedure, if it was an elective surgery, we were not accepting patients. So we went to about 500 patients in the hospital. We weren't prepared for that. We weren't prepared for the visitor policy to change, which was so heartbreaking. It went from, okay, we can let in just a few visitors to we can let in just one visitor, to we can let in no visitors, unless it's under a very special circumstance. We were not prepared for the fear that we would feel knowing that we were going to be working directly with people who were possibly carrying the virus and then with the respiratory folks and the nurses and the physicians who were actually one-on-one -on -one working with folks that were diagnosed with COVID. There was so much unknown and so much we had to learn. And in the weeks following the first cases, we learned what true resiliency is and flexibility. I remember in a meeting with my supervisor very early in the pandemic, I remember crying. I was just crying and I was telling her, I am not a hero. I, I, I'm just not, I'm just not one of those people. I, I just don't feel that in me. I did not sign up for this. Yes, as a minister, we run towards trouble. That's one of the things we say. We do, we run towards trouble. A lot of times people have that instinct 
to run away, but we run towards trouble. We are with people in the most difficult moments of their lives, but this was unlike any trouble that I had ever known. I didn't want to get the virus and possibly bring it home to my children. I was afraid and the staff was afraid. And so I told my supervisor, I didn't know how to support the staff and be strong for them when I myself was really worried. And she told me, just be honest, just be honest and let them know that you can relate to how they were feeling. And so as we moved forward in the new world of COVID-19, we were called to be honest with one another and to be fluid and to be ready to follow protocol that was changing hour by hour, minute by minute, things were changing at the beginning. And, and they have, they fluctuated back and forth, especially in Florida where kind of things are worse than they were at the beginning. So we're having to be very flexible. Looking back on the past few months, I see how we have been called to notice what I would name is God's presence or the holy or that which is greater than us or the community to notice and lift up the suffering. We have to notice the suffering that is taking place and we have to offer grace in these moments of fear and doubt and we have to persevere persevere through challenges that we have never faced before and be comforted by hope which i will get to in a minute so i wonder where is god in these moments of adjustment and fear in the midst of this ongoing pandemic? And how do we sustain ourselves? How do we persevere as we continue to navigate this very, very difficult journey? So where I see God, and I use God, that's, that's my language, you can translate that into however you want to, but I see God, I see, one another, ourselves, in each other, and noticing and giving thanks and praise to those who are dedicated to helping. So one of the things that I did um, at the beginning was to put out a request on my neighborhood Facebook group, asking folks to just donate items. I just thought, you know, let's just see what kind of response I can get to this asking them to donate any items that might show appreciation to the staff at the hospital. And the response I got was mind blowing. I got dozens and dozens and dozens of people who gathered snacks and little bags of popcorn. Oh my goodness. The nursing staff loves the little bags of popcorn and ho-hos and Twinkies and cookies because you need that stuff sometimes, but also almonds and water bottles and pictures. N kids in the neighborhood drew pictures, um, letting them know that they're, they were heroes. I had a florist that gave us just all these bouquets of beautiful flowers. I had a caterer who made homemade energy bars to give to the staff and uh, the really cool thing I thought was my neighbors ended up telling me how meaningful it was for them to help because they felt so helpless. So that is definitely a testament to generosity and how generosity and thinking of others both benefits the receiver for sure, but also the giver that is offering that generosity. So what I did is I put these items on a cart and I made little signs because I was a DRE for many, many years. So I'm really good at making cute little signs. So I got my markers out and I made a sign that said, you know, COVID-19 staff support cart. And I would push the cart around the hospital and I passed these items out, not only 
to the nurses and the medical staff who are super awesome and deserve our appreciation, but also the environmental service techs. These are the folks that are keeping the hospital clean and sanitary and are marginalized and their hard work is often overlooked, but they are so essential. They are so essential to keeping everyone who comes into that hospital safe. I also delivered items to the security team. They are often overlooked. I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine how difficult it was for them to stand. We went to one door being open. You could only come into TGH through one door in this huge hospital. So through this one door is when we checked everyone, nurses were there doing temperatures and the security had to say, I'm sorry, but you cannot come in and visit your loved one who was sick in the hospital. I can't imagine how hard that was for them. So I wanted to love up on them and I wrote them little notes on pieces of paper, heart shaped pieces of paper and brought them the snacks and just let them know we appreciate everything that you are doing. I also took uh, the bouquets of the flowers to dietary. Dietary are the folks that are feeding us they're feeding the staff and they're feeding the patients because they are also often overlooked. Um, more of the you know, lower wage workers in the hospital. And I gotta tell you, I could not have sustained myself through this pandemic without Taco Tuesday and without being able to go and have, they have really great um, espresso. We have really great cafeteria and or chocolate pudding or chocolate cake sometimes you just need comfort food and so i wanted the dietary folks to know thank you thank you so much for being here and helping us so we can help others the vibe in the hospital actually felt like we were more united than we ever had been before. And I don't know if that's because we were all wearing masks and walking through the hallways and we had to actually like really look at each other's eyes, but we felt connected. We also, I got a team of folks to get um, sidewalk chalk and chalk the entrances to as the staff walked into the hospital with inspirational messages um, in English and in Spanish. It is so groovy that y'all do both Spanish and English. Um, I know we're gonna do it with the Spirit of Life in a minute and then with the chalice lighting because we have a lot of folks at the hospital that are Spanish speaking only. And so we did both English and Spanish messages of just encouragement and saying, we are in this together because we are truly in this together. In today's story, we thought about how a pearl is made, how from something troublesome springs forth something beautiful. One of the beautiful things that I think has come out of this horrible pandemic is a more full understanding of our seventh principle. Now I'm not gonna, I wish I could like quiz y'all. Like, does anyone know the seventh principle? The seventh principle is the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. Unfortunately, one of the ways that we have seen this is in witnessing how a virus can so easily spread across the globe. If that is not a testament to how connected, interconnected we are, I don't know what is. But a beautiful thing is seeing countries that are learning and helping one another. We are helping each other learn how to combat this virus. If we would listen to one another, that would be a good idea too. Other thing is like seeing individuals who are putting on their masks. You know, we're not used to wearing masks. Also, you know, some of us are kind of vain. Although I love how it's almost a fashion statement now to have the different, I look, I mean, y'all look, I love fashion. I love flashy things. So you can, I've got a dozen masks with butterflies and all sorts of stuff. So 
I think it's a cool thing. It's like another fashion accessory. So if you're wearing your mask, if you're quarantining, which has been so hard, I actually quarantined from my children for uh, months because I was, I didn't want to expose them. And there's a lot of hospital workers and other folks that have done that as well. And we all have been quarantining. Um, well, most of us have been quarantining. So thank you everyone who is quarantining. It shows how much we care for one another. We are doing what we can to not spread the illness. In order to help one another, because we are so connected, we had to disconnect, which I know has been very difficult. I'm an extrovert, so you can imagine um, it's been very, very difficult. And I'm also a hugger. Oh, I miss hugging. I just want to hug, hug, hug. When this is over with, I'm just like hugging everybody. Well, except for those that don't like hugs. I would ask first. I won't just hug. Always ask before you hug somebody. As a chaplain, I've spent so many hours supporting staff and helping them develop ways to spiritually ground themselves. Like Susanna was speaking of earlier, how do you ground yourself in a time that's out of normal time? Granola bars, inspirational messages, they're only one little piece of how we supported our staff. I also sat with them and listened. That's what chaplains do. So much of what chaplaining is, is just listening. Just listening to fears and anxieties. And I offered them a few tools. And today I want to offer you these tools as well. Also note, this is not the new normal. I do not like hearing that. This is not the new normal. This is different. This is different. This is a time out of normal time. This is a time filled with not knowing. Our lives have changed dramatically. And so be gentle with yourself. Try not to beat yourself up for not getting all the things done that you normally get done. Give yourself some grace during this funky time. And for those of us that are used to being like, go, go, go. That's the kind of person I am. I know it's surprising. Go, 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 do, do, do. I got like a huge to-do list. I got to get all these things done, done, get all these things done. Just breathe, just breathe. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. I know that this is taking its toll, but I encourage you just to take the time and rest and connect with friends and family and your community through technology and the telephone. You can actually use these to call people. I didn't know that, but you actually can talk to them. I normally just, I'm a texter. And Facebook, oh goodness, I'm on the Facebook. I don't, I couldn't live without the Facebook. So stay in touch with people. If you have a family, you know, bless you, you have them to be with you, but there's so many of us that live alone. So don't get used to this as the normal. Try to reach out. And if you have someone that you haven't heard from, reach out to them and just check on them. How are you doing? You know, how are you feeling? And it's okay to complain. It's okay to say this is this is this is awful. You know, just reach out to one another and stay connected because we need those connections to survive. Call upon your spiritual practice to ground you. So, what is your spiritual practice? Is it prayer? Gardening? Is it singing? Bird watching? Is it knitting or exercising? like Susanna spoke of, or is it meditation, hiking, could be dancing, that's mine. I love to dance. I feel most connected when I'm dancing or when I'm hiking. And I, I was really blessed this past few weeks, I got to go see my parents up in uh, the North Carolina mountains, which was gorgeous. And um, that was very like, what's a good word for that? Just like soul comforting just made me kind of like shut my brain off for a little bit and like feel okay just to be surrounded in nature. 
or perhaps your spiritual practice is cleaning. And if so, my address is 801 West. And it just, just kidding. You don't have to come clean my house, but that would be appreciated because I have two teenage boys and it's disgusting. And their spiritual practice is not cleaning. I think their spiritual practice is sleeping. But anyway, the point is keep yourself connected to spirit, connected to yourself, your very essence of being by continuing your practice. And it's called a practice for a reason. We must be intentional about engaging in our practice. Okay, so this leads to hope. Hope. My friend and colleague Miranda Harrison Quillen recently shared with me a great definition of hope. And I gotta be honest with you. I'm in the hope business. That's what we say as ministers. We're in the hope business. But some days, it is truly difficult for me to feel hopeful. I'm just being honest with you. I got my bad days. But hope doesn't mean that everything is just going to magically get better and that there's going to be no more illness and no more stress and no more conflict. That is not realistic. Having hope does not mean you are naive. It means you know the things are going to work out as they are going to work out. We should not be ashamed to feel hope. We should hold on to hope, knowing that we have one another, knowing that our lives have meaning and purpose, and knowing that we are loved unconditionally, even on our worst days. And trust me, I've had some doozies lately. Did I mention I've been with my parents for the past three weeks? I was not always at my best. Let me just put it that way. But I know that they love me. And I know that I am loved by my community. And I know that I, my personal theology, I believe that I'm loved by God. We are loved. We are just loved as a people. So remember that. And for me, that gives me hope. Life will continue on and we will adjust, and we will bend, and we will love one another, and we will take it one day at a time. One of the ultimate reasons that we are here is to love, to love one another and to comfort one another when life is so very challenging. We experience the comfort of the divine, that which is larger than ourselves, our beloved community washing over us and holding us as we continue this journey forward. In a time of pandemic and revolution, that's also taking place. In a time of pandemic and revolution and personal struggles, because we are all, we all got our own stuff going on amongst all this other stuff. We're also carrying our own personal pain and struggles. We're called to trust that all that is meant to be will be. All that is meant to be will be. And so now I invite you to sing wherever you are, as loud as you want, with your mic continued to be muted, of course, and as off key as you might be, which I promise I will be, because I'm not the greatest singer in the world, but I love to sing. But when I'm in the pulpit, I always make sure the sound man makes sure to turn my mic off because they didn't once and let's not even go there. That was incredibly embarrassing. But I would like for you to sing wherever you are. And the name of the song is Comfort Me. I want you to notice the words as we sing together virtually. As we go forward, as we go forward in this journey, remember to comfort one another, to sing with one another, to speak out when voices are being silenced, and to dance, even if it's over Zoom, even if it's in your kitchen, even if you are alone, 
I've done a lot of dancing alone. We continue to go forward. We continue to dance. Now let us sing. beautiful. The work that we do in living out our Unitarian Universalist values within our congregation and in the world is only possible through the generosity of our members and friends. Phil has posted the ways to donate um, through Breeze or by mailing to the church um, for our regular offering. We are also doing a SAC special collection today for Doctors Without Borders. The information about Doctors Without Borders was in continuum. Philip will also enter the donation URL in the chat. When using the online donation form, please check the box marked, make this gift in honor or memory of someone and enter Paint Branch Unitarian Universalist Church. And now David will play, Little Things Mean a Lot.
we are going. Heaven knows where we are going, but we know we will get there. We will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there. We know we will get there. It will be hard. We know that the road will be muddy and rough, but we will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there. We know we will get there. Whoa, well, yeah, yeah, we keep going. Whoa, well, yeah, yeah, we keep going. Whoa, well, yeah, yeah, we keep going. And now David will play Spirit of Life. Bill will display the lyrics for us as we sing, first in Spanish and then in English. And now I will extinguish the chalice. Now Chuck will break us out into chat rooms. You have the option of joining a small chat group or staying in the main meeting to talk with our guest minister. <laughs> 